Welt. At the foothills of the Appalachian chain Down through the rivers to the coastal plain There's a place that I call home And I'll never be alone Singing this Carolina love song I've got South Carolina on my mind Remembering all those sunshine summer times And the beauty of the autumn When the leaves turn to gold Touches my heart and thrills my soul I have South Carolina on my mind With those clean snow-covered mountain winter times And the white sands of the beaches And those Carolina beaches I've got South Carolina on my mind Today, we're not going to go very far in time or very far in space. Um, we are going to go to South Carolina. There's an awful lot that could be said, um, and we don't have enough time. When I first got to South Carolina, I took a 12-hour Ollie course on the history of South Carolina. Took about 17 to 20 pages of notes for each class, and we still only skimmed the surface. Um, basically, I'm going to do a kind of an introduction to the first 100 years of South Carolina, um, and then give you some tidbits, which I always, before the pandemic, I would have said, we're doing um, cocktail party tidbits. They're sort of things you can drop into conversation. So did you know that? So I'm gonna do you know, some did you know that you kind of go, whoa, maybe I need to go see that place. Um, so South Carolina is the smallest of the, of the deep states. Hang on a second. Um, I apologize for that noise. Um, it's the smallest of the, the uh, deep south states. It is number 40 in size among the states. It fits into Alaska 21 times. It fits into Texas only eight and a half times. Its coastline from North Carolina to Georgia as the crow flies is about 187 miles long. But if we include all the bays and the inlets and the islands, the state's coastline is 2,876 miles, which means nothing to most of us. But it is slightly more than the distance by interstate from Charleston to San Francisco, okay? long coastline. When the first Europeans came, they claimed the land. Now, the Europeans had this habit of just saying, um, I see this land and all the land around it, it's all mine. Uh, when De Soto saw the Mississippi, um, he stuck a flag in and he said, I claim this river and all the land next to it for Spain and all the rivers that flow into it and all the land next to them for Spain. Well, roughly he was claiming without having seen from the Appalachians to the Rockies, from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Arctic, but you know, they could just claim it, but they didn't have it. Eventually the East coast of the United, of what's now the United States was claimed by England. Um, France took Canada because there were furs. Spain took Central and South America because there was gold. And they left the middle part, what we call the United States, because they thought it was worthless. Um, and so England claimed it. And when the kings began handing out land, um, 
they said, well, you can have the land from the ocean all the way to the next ocean, which meant, in fact, that the first charter of the Carolinas is the darkest green that goes all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And then they, the king made it a little bit better, a little bit bigger. Um, now, one of the things is that the kings in the 1600s really needed money and they didn't really want to raise taxes because that made them pretty unpopular. And so they would borrow money from wealthy noblemen and then to pay the noblemen back, they would give them land. Uh, you may know that William Penn's father had loaned money to the king and William Penn said, well, give me, Pen give me some land and he got Pennsylvania. Um, the island of Nantucket was actually given away three times in a decade because the kings didn't know what they had. They, you know, that's like me saying, oh, you can have that bridge down in Charleston. I don't know how many bridges are down there. You know, which bridge am I giving it away? Obviously, this was that land that's in green was the original Carolinas. Um, Carolinas meant named for King Charles. Um, it's obviously gotten smaller over time, um, but um, the border, the borders have been a little bit of a problem, uh, particularly the border between North and South Carolina. I don't know if you remember back in, in 2017, on January 1st, there was a change in the border between North and South Carolina and a total of 19 homes changed states. Um, three people went to bed on December 31st living in North Carolina, and they woke up the next day living in South Carolina, and 16 people went to sleep in South Carolina and woke up in North Carolina, which of course made all sorts of problems in terms of taxation. Uh, there some families had children in yes. colleges, which were state colleges, and suddenly you're no longer an in-state resident. Um, gas stations, which had been, been selling fireworks, in South Carolina are now in North Carolina and can't sell fireworks. I mean, it just, it was crazy. Um, but the original boundary between North and South Carolina was based on rocks and trees and, and um, things that are no longer there. So we finally think we got the border worked out. So the Carolinas, uh, which originally went from somewhere in Virginia down into Florida, ultimately become North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. North Carolina and South Carolina split in 1712. Uh, and as this says, the boundary was uncertain until 1771. Actually, the boundary was uncertain until 2017. And Georgia is pulled off in uh, 1722. Okay. Overall, the state is about 225 miles from north to south and 285 miles east to west. A huge number of landforms. Um, we've got everything from the coastal lowlands, coastal plains, the Piedmonts, the Sandhills, the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, we've got barrier islands. We also have something called Carolina Bays. And they're pretty unique. They're unique in the United States and although they, we can find them in places like Maryland down to Florida, most of them are found in North and South Carolina. And I actually think most are found in South Carolina. Carolina bays are small elliptical depressions which become wetlands. And if you can, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. These are Carolina bays. And they all go in this northwest to southeast configuration. Um, no one knows how they were formed, why they were formed. Here's a, um, a LIDAR view. And it, I mean, it looks like some sort of splatter, doesn't it? Um, we have no clue what these are. They are just Carolina Bays. And when the first Europeans came, they called the land Chikura, and they were, um, and we see that name around it still at times. 
they were really impressed with the marshes and the moss draped trees. It was so different from anything that they had in, in Europe. Um, the cypress swamps, they called a land of opp oppressive beauty. And as they moved inland, they were impressed by the trees. In the British Isles in the 1600s, there were 12 kinds of trees. That's it, 12. In the Carolinas, and this includes North and South Carolina and Georgia, there were more than 100 types of trees. Okay, so think about, you know, and trees that they had never imagined before, trees coming out of a swamp like this. The pine trees were kind of like liquid, a, a gold source for them. Um, somewhere in your um, geography class or history class, you heard the term naval stores. These pine trees were hard pine and they could use the timber for shipbuilding. And the, the pine trees were great for masts. Pine trees also produce turpentine and pitch, both necessary in terms of, of building ships. So they, the, you have the pine trees. The first people who were here were not, of course, the Europeans. They were the Native Americans. And we know very little about them. Uh, many of them are remembered only because of their names. There may have been as many as 40 different Native American nations here. But the first Europeans, the Spanish, brought with them epidemics and they wiped out huge numbers of these groups. By the time the English arrived, who were the first who actually recorded information about the local inhabitants, many of the local groups had vanished. We know that among these Native American nations, women played an important role and sometimes a major role in government. Many of the early land grants were, were witnessed by women. Women greeted visitors, and we know that there were women chieftains. We know that the women of the Native American um, groups sat on councils that decided things of war and peace. Today, there is only one federally recognized tribe in South Carolina, and that's the Catawbas up there by Rock Hill. Um, there are nine state recognized tribes, and I meant to write them down and I didn't, but there are nine tribes that the state recognizes. As far as we can tell, the Native American groups who lived in South Carolina coexisted. Did they fight? Yes, but they didn't fight to eliminate another group or subjugate them. They fought to prove something like bravery. And as I was thinking about this and reading about it, it seemed to me that it became like the rivalry between Boston and New York. Um, the Red Sox just want to beat the Yankees. The people in Boston don't want to rule New York. They just want to beat the Yankees. Um, and uh, the Yankees want to beat the Red Sox and maybe everybody else as, as well. Um, you know, if you think about rivalries between sports teams, that's sort of the, what happened between the Native American groups here. So we don't know much about the Native Americans. Uh, there is some archeological work going on in the state right now, but not very much. The Spanish were the first in, um, well, in really in the New World, but also in South Carolina. In 1521, and this is just, the, the Spanish have just barely set foot in the Americas. In 1521, an expedition of Spanish explorers landed somewhere on the coast of South Carolina. And they tricked a group of natives to come on board and then sailed away, intending to sell these natives into slavery. One was a young man who is named Francisco Chicora by the Spanish. Francisco learned Spanish, becomes Christian, and eventually goes to Spain, where he begins telling stories about his homeland. One set of stories was about a type of people with three foot long tails, and they had to dig three foot deep holes in order to sit. Um, you sort of wonder where that story came from. Um, 
But anyway, his stories convinced the Spanish government to set up a colony uh, on the South Carolina coast. And so five years after the Spanish first explorer, they send out six ships with a total of 600 settlers. They have livestock, they have slaves, they have missionaries, and they land and they set up San Miguel de Guadalupe. And this is probably somewhere around Winya Bay in the Georgetown area. And I've looked and I haven't seen anything, whether they've actually located the site of this or not, I, I have found no proof, but somewhere up there. Um, and it was pretty swampy. Um, Francisco Chikura was brought in as their interpreter and he probably deserted them. I mean, he went, I'm home, I'm out of here. Um, the slaves that they brought rebelled um, and the Spanish settlers didn't have enough food to get through the winter and the natives, probably warned by Francisco Chikura, wouldn't help them. And only 150 of the original 600 settlers survived. And that was the first attempt at a European colony in what is now the United States. It was a Spanish colony. It was a failure. Now, the Spanish are going all over the place, including uh, De Soto. De Soto traveled through the region in the 1540s. He was welcomed. He stayed in one village. We're not sure where, uh, but he stayed in one place for two weeks. And then he took all the women of the village hostage to ensure that he would be treated well. I'm not sure why you think that's a good thing to do, but that's how the Spanish approach life. But over in Europe, the Spanish that are getting these colonies and claiming all this land, they're also in competition with the French. And the French decide to get into the act. So the Spanish are getting into the act in the 1520s, 1530s, 1540s. It takes the French until the 1560s. And they decide to set up a colony um, and they land on what is now Paris Island down by Charleston. And they build a fort and they called it Port Royal. And this was to be step one. They bring in 28 men and they build a wooden fort. Okay, so they're gonna have a fort and they're gonna have these men and these men are going to lay the groundwork for people to come in. The ship returns to France to get supplies and bring over more colonists. But when the ship goes back, they find that France is involved in a religious war and the government, which is to pay the people to come over and, and buy the supplies and send over more ships, aren't, is too busy fighting a war to be involved with a, a, a settlement. And so uh, the supplies don't come. Meanwhile, back on Paris Island, the supplies don't arrive, they're running low on food, and then the blockhouse, which they had, in which they had stored their supplies, has, catches on fire. The fact that it has a thatched roof makes the fire go even faster. They lose all of their supplies. The men, you know, remember it's only 28 men and there's one commander that, among them, the, me, the men mutiny and kill the commander. They build themselves a boat, probably a, a kind of a big raft, and they use their shirts and the sheets that they have for sails, and they're gonna try to sail back across the Atlantic, okay? So think about these guys. They sort of build a raft, and they're gonna sail themselves 3,000 miles across the Atlantic. The trip is described by those few who survived as a hell of starvation, cannibalism, and madness. They only, we only have survivors because they were found by a British ship and returned to Europe. So the French come, they're not successful. So the Spanish decide to try again. And this time they set up a, a colony in Santa Elena or St. Helena's just on the border between South Carolina and Georgia. And this eventually becomes more than a military outpost. Um, there are farmers, there are uh, women, there are children, there's a blacksmith, there's a carpenter, there's even a notary and a tavern. Uh, and it's relatively prosperous 
but the problem still is food. And their solution was when they couldn't raise enough food for themselves was to go and attack and the local na natives and steal their food. And they managed to kill three local chieftains, which doesn't help, uh, doesn't win them friends. Um, and ultimately the Spanish, after a couple of years of, this, of financing this colony, the Spanish order the residents to abandon the town. They say, we're not gonna support you anymore, leave, you all have to leave. And they destroy the homes and go elsewhere. Archeological evidence shows people um, really treating the area as a home. They've got cooking pots, plates, uh, pipes. Uh, there's some expensive imported, imported items. There's definitely children. Um, the settlers actually file a court case against the government for their losses. I've lost my home, I've lost my investment. Um, but for the Spanish, colonies were to make money. This colony in St. Helena's was not making them any money. Yes, the people may, might have, with some help, been self-sufficient, but they weren't making money for the Spanish government. So Spanish try twice, not successful. French try, not successful. Now we're going to look at the English. The English in 1627 had gone down to Barbados. And the first years in the Barbados had been difficult. They grew tobacco and cotton. They used indentured servants to do the work. But by the 1640s, they've discovered the money crop, and that's sugar. Sugar could be used for rum and molasses and sugar, just sugar itself. And the indentured servants were replaced by slaves. And the people who owned these sugar plantations become very rich with a desire to become richer. In 1639, there were 200 slaves on the island of Barbados, about 3% of the population. In 13 years, there were 20,000 slaves on the island, okay? So we go from 200 to 20,000 in 13 years. And the slaves outnumbered the white population. It was cheaper to buy a slave for life than to pay for an indentured servant who would work only for five to seven years. An indentured servant was someone who you paid their passage over and they agreed to work for you. You would give them room and board uh, and they would work for five to seven years. And at the end of that time, they could go off and do whatever they wanted to. But this desire for money, the Barbados, these guys are making lots and lots of money. Uh, once you have the initial investment and the slave, there's no more investment in that. All you're doing is making profit. And this desire for more profit leads a group of men to petition the king in 1663 for more land. And they're asking for land, which becomes the colony of the Carolinas, named, of course, for King Charles. This is the charter. Um, this is the document that gives this land um, to this group of people. These are eight Lord proprietors. These are eight men who literally are given this land by the king and they, if you think about the word proprietor, a proprietor is an owner. They own the Carolinas. They have the right to make war, to make peace, to collect taxes, to raise an army, to control all trade. Um, they can um, control, um, uh, imports and exports, and they have the right to sell land. And these eight men, we see pictures of seven of them. We don't have a picture of Sir John Colleton. Um, they get all the land between the Virginia and, the, and Florida. Um, these are some of the wealthiest men in England. They have no intention of moving over here. Zero, none. They're living a life of luxury. Why would they want to live here? Um, but they want to make a profit. <clears throat> they figure they can sell this, this land to people like the guys from the Barbados. And they, first of all, they would get money from um, the selling of the land, but then they would collect taxes on the land and the taxes on the money that these people would make. Um, so there are three ships and more than a hundred men and women um, who are going to set up the first colony. 
And the guy who seems to be the, the mover and shaker of all of this is um, Lord Ashley, Anthony Ashley Cooper. He knows that they're going to have to have some sort of government because they're not going to go over and rule, but they're going to have to have some sort of government. And he goes to John Locke. And John Locke was a very well-known political theorist. He actually was an influencer of the American Revolution. And John Locke comes up with the fundamental constitutions of the Carolinas. He sets up a framework of government which allows for religious toleration, citizenship for those that were from England, but also not from England. So um, you can come from any place. We don't really care. You have the right to own property. But if you were a large landowner, if you bought enough land, they would give you a title. Um, and the Church of England would, in fact, be supported because that's what they, um, they did in England in your, your taxes. You didn't, when you went to the Church of England, they didn't take a collection because the Church of England was already supported by your tax dollars. But all you had to do was believe in God to settle in the Carolinas. So Quakers came, Protestants of all types, Catholics came. Um, it was the second most tolerant of all the colonies in terms of religion. Only Rhode Island was more uh, tolerant. And, but South Carolina had the largest Jewish population of all the colonies because you, all you had to do was believe in God. Didn't have to believe in Jesus. All you had to do was believe in God. There were some property qualifications to hold office, but if you owned land and brought someone else over to settle, you were given more land. Also in this document that was drawn up, there was the guarantee right to absolute control over slavery. So slavery was written in to the first document um, of governance for the Carolinas by the English. So in August of 1669, um, a, this group of three ships and 100 men and women arrive in the Barbados. Um, they set out for the Carolinas in February. They're apparently rest, you know, resting from recuperating from the voyage and picking up more people and supplies. They're forced to go to Bermuda, but finally in mid-March of 1670s, they land in what is the area of Charleston. And there were about 130 settlers at first. The Barbados are running, is running out of land. And so the, the younger sons, the elder son's going to inherit the, the sugar plantation. The elder, younger sons are saying, hey, we're going to go up there to Charleston. We're going to go up there to the Carolinas. And we're going to get more land so we can become rich as well. So starting with about 130 people in, 18, in 1670, um, within 25 years, there's about 5,000 people living in the Carolinas. About 1,000 of them lived in the peninsula of Charlestown. For all practical purposes, there's no infrastructure. They're, living, they're just building their houses wherever they feel like building them. Um, and um, we have one document from um, the group of people in Charleston this is from the um, 1690s, and it's a um, agreement to pay someone to be a night watchman, to wander up and down the streets at night to make sure that no bad things are happening. Um, pretty much, um, the people who were settled here didn't have much, there wasn't much government influencing their life, and they didn't really want government to walk in and solve their problems they either, either individually or as a group solved their own problems. They didn't want government intervening. So originally it was Charlestown for King Charles, becomes Charleston. Um, and it becomes a, a magnet for people to come and um, settle. And what we find is that the people who settle here have plantations up the rivers. And then when the plantations are uh, kind of downtime, you come back to the city of Charleston and live. 
people are, um, we know that by uh, 1712, North Carolina splits off, um, but the people who are living in South Carolina are beginning to look for ways to become wealthy. And rice, shipbuilding, cotton, indigo. Sugar didn't make it up here, but rice, indigo, cotton, shipbuilding bring prosperity. And by the middle of the 18th century, Charleston was the wealthiest city in America. It was wealthier than Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Williamsburg, Charlottesville, and Baltimore combined. Okay? Combined. Nine out of the 10 wealthiest people in the American colonies lived in South Carolina at the time of the American Revolution, and all nine lived in the Charleston area. Okay? It was unbelievably rich. Okay? We know that North Carolina splits off. Um, in 1712, the lines are drawn in, in um, uh, 1729, it becomes a royal colony. Georgia is set off in 1733. Georgia, named for King George, um, was set up uh, to protect South Carolina. South Carolina and Charleston, because of their wealth, because of the wealth they had and the wealth that they were sending to back to England, um, it was just, you know, it was the heart of the wealth of the colonies. And the Spanish, who were down in Florida were encouraging the Native Americans um, to attack the plantations and the people. They weren't, we weren't attacking Charleston because that would be silly, but the plantations are frequently very isolated. And so they were, the Spanish were encouraging, maybe paying the Native Americans to attack and steal the wealth. And so the idea was we would create Georgia as a buffer state. And you might remember that Georgia, Savannah, was set up by James Oglethorpe, who had the brilliant idea of taking people out of debtor's prisons. For some reason, for several centuries, the English had this habit of if you were in debt, they put you in prison until you could pay your debt off. Of course, if you're in prison, it's a little hard to pay your debt off. You had a hope that somebody in your family would come up with the money. Um, so we're gonna create this colony of Georgia filled with people who are from the prisons. And so who cares if they get killed by the, the Native Americans? It's a buffer state for the wealth of South Carolina. So while most of the, the first settlers in South Carolina were English, South Carolina, because it let people in of different religions, didn't matter where you were from, is much more ethnically diverse than many of the other colonies. There were a large group of French Protestants who were fleeing persecution in France. France had begun the 1600s with this idea of uh, religious toleration. By the 1700s, they are saying, no, you've got to be Catholic, and if you're Protestant, you better get convert or get out. We have the French Huguenots settling here. Orangeburg is settled by the Germans. We've got an area that's settled by the Welsh. Um, there's an area that's Swiss. Um, and of course, as I said, there's a large uh, Jewish population. So we have Scandinavians, we've got Germans, we've got French, we've got Scots, we've got Welsh, we've got Irish. And of course, we have the people who came less willingly, and that is that we have the African Americans. By seven, the 1700s, Blacks were the majority of the population of South Carolina. Most of them were born in Africa. By best estimates, there were two dozen ethnic groups and 40 different languages that came from Africa. Many of the, them lived on remote plantations with very few whites around. Um, you think, well, why didn't they run away? Um, where are they gonna run to? Um, you know, they're not gonna be able to get back home again. 
uh, where are you going to go? Where's it safe? You're surrounded by alligators and snakes and horrible things like that. Because they lived in these remote plantations with very few whites around, many aspects of African culture survived in South Carolina and emerged into a distinct culture and language, Gullah. And there was a program just recently on um, PBS on Gullah. Um, Brooke Green has had a series of talks and presentations on Gullah. If you have a chance to see any of these, you should do so. The language of Gullah has no cases, no tenses and verbs, no genders and pronouns. Whites shrug, shrugged off this, this is slave talk. They didn't pay any attention to it. But for blacks, it gave them a way to communicate with each other right in front of unsuspecting white slave owners. Now, the history of slavery in South Carolina, it was there from the very beginning. Uh, it is worth a lecture in and of itself. It plays a major role in the state's history, um, and it's not a good role. Um, in 2018, um, just a little over two years ago, uh, Charleston apologized for the fact that 40% of the slaves in America entered through that city. 40% okay, of all the slaves in America came through Charleston. The apology doesn't do much, but it is an admission that it was a blot on the history of the city. And slavery was a moneymaker for a very long time in South Carolina. And basically it is, you cannot separate the history of slavery and the history of South Carolina. They are tied together. By the 1700s, a number of people are making serious money here in South Carolina, but not the proprietors back in England. Um, and so South Carolina becomes a royal colony. Um, and, but as a royal colony, the king sends over a governor, but there is an elected legislature. But the elected legislature was controlled by the wealthy elite, the plantation owners. And these wealthy planters were related to each other. Uh, about 70% of the people in any legislature in South Carolina were relatives. John Rutledge in one session was related to one fifth of the people serving uh, with him. The other people were merchants and lawyers from Charleston. Everybody's economic interest aligned with the planters. And we begin to see this real split in the Carolinas at, the, at this time between the upstate and Charleston, because the upstate is not wealthy planters and they're feeling like they're being ignored by what, what's going on. Economically, South Carolina is booming. Um, it's one of the most, prosper, it's the most prosperous city. Uh, Charleston is the most prosperous city. South Carolina, one of the most prosperous colonies. Um, rice is the leading export. They're exp exporting millions of pounds of rice. Indigo, they are experimenting with silkworms and wine and hemp. Uh, you still have the, the um, uh, timber. Um, you have this before uh, the American Revolution, South Carolina was probably the most diverse of all the colonies. It was the fastest growing, not by birth, but by immigration. It was, you know, it, it, we think about people wanting to come to New York because the streets were paved with gold. Before the American Revolution, it was Charleston you wanted to go to because that's where you make, got rich. There were lots of epidemics, smallpox, yellow fever, malaria. Women had lots of children, but there was very high infant mortality. And of course, you have the occasional hurricane. The elite tended to co uh, live along the coast, up country, much more rustic, much more rural. Now, in the 1700s, we have a series of wars, the last of which was the French and Indian War. As you have more settlement, there's more disputes uh, over land. The Spanish are, are claiming land. Remember, everybody just sort of said, I claim all this land, and the borders were really uncertain. And as, as people begin to, to settle, you have more and more people, they begin to want to move westward, and we have these, these disputes over land. And you can see that 
uh, England and France who aren't getting along in Europe are also disputing land over here. And there's a series of three wars, the last of which was the French and Indian War, it's known as the Seven Years' War in Europe, and you can say, wait a minute here, 1554 to uh, 1754 to 1763 is nine years, not seven. It was nine years here, it was seven years in Europe, and you can see that the British gained a lot of land. They gained basically the land west to the uh, Mississippi. Problem is that during the war, the Native Americans had been the allies of the French because they didn't like the English. And England, after the war, does a couple of things. One, they say, yes, we have all that land in the light pink, but we're gonna let the Indians have that. That made the colonists really angry. But they also say, oh, by the way, this war was expensive. And this war started because of George Washington. George Washington, as a young surveyor, gets into trouble with uh, going to Pittsburgh. Uh, the message is don't go to Pittsburgh. But, um, you know, he, the war starts here. And the colonists benefited by the war, but the colonists aren't paying any taxes. And so England starts saying, you know what? We're paying taxes here. You're not paying taxes there you should be paying, help pay for the cost of war because the English are terribly in debt. And as soon as the French and Indian War is over, they enact the stamp tax. This is a tax on paper. This is a tax that was paid by everybody in England. You paid a tax on writing paper, a tax on wallpaper, a tax on, on playing cards. Um, paper was taxed. And the history books talk about Boston but Charleston also rebelled about this and they were rioting. They, Charleston had its own Sons of Liberty group and they held a march through the city with carrying a coffin which was labeled Liberty, you know, where the British are killing freedom. Uh, the government close, was closed down, the port of Charleston was closed down. Um, but eventually the stamp tax was repealed. Now we were not as bad as they were in North Carolina. In North Carolina, um, they had a, a group of armed citizens who attacked the um, um, home of the governor uh, in, in Tryon, um, but um, everybody was unhappy. The British keep trying to find ways of tax making the colonists pay for the troops that are over here for the cost of the war, and of course, Ultimately, it's a tax on tea. And in 1773, the ship London arrives in Charleston with 257 chests of tea. There were ships that went into Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston. Boston tossed it in the harbor. Okay, you all know the Boston Tea Party. Charleston confiscated it, and they stored it in the basement of the uh, city hall and then after the war broke out they sold it uh to to fund the military um to fund their um uh campaign against the british um months before so and you the the charleston tea party um was held before the boston tea party months before um the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia. South Carolina wrote its first constitution. They set up a government that with a president, a vice president, and a legislature. They said it will be temporary until the current government goes away. This was in March of 1776. They have set up a government that there is no king. They have said there's no king here. Um, so long before the Declaration of Independence, South Carolina is leading the way. Four representatives from South Carolina signed the Declaration of Independence. Two were captured by the British and sent to the Tower of London and were imprisoned there. South Carolina was the first to ratify the Articles of Confederation, which was the first government of the United States after the war was over. They were the eighth to ratify the Constitution, a little slower on the Constitution, and they were also the first to secede. 
70 years later. Now, the flag, or the basis of our flag, comes from um, the American Revolution. This was designed by Colonel Moultrie, who was um, uh, defending Charleston Harbor against the British. He built a fort uh, out on Sullivan's Island. The blue, he cho chose the blue because it was the color of their uniforms. Well, South Carolina produced indigo, so it was an easy color to have here. The crescent, we're not quite sure where the crescent comes from. It may have been some sort of insignia on a uniform, we don't know, but the original crescent had the word liberty on it. Um, there is Moultrie's forces kept the British from taking Charleston when the war opens up, um, but in the upstate, uh, the support was much more for the British. Now, from the British point of view, they want the Southern colonies. They don't really want the Northern colonies. They're gonna let, they would let Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Connecticut and Rhode Island and they, even New York go. They're not worth it. Uh, the money's coming from the South. The money is coming from Virginia and South Carolina. Not so much from North Carolina, okay? North Carolina was the valley between the two richest places. Um, but they wanted the South. And so they, the British spent a lot of time fighting here in the South. We don't talk about it much in school, but they did. There are more Revolutionary War battles in South Carolina than in any other state or colony. Um, and most of them, to be perfectly honest, were British victories. Yes, we had Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. Um, but when the war broke out, it was probably true here the same as it was in most of the colonies, about one third of the people patriots, one third of the people loyalists, and one third of the people, eh, I don't really know, I don't care. Um, but the British treatment of people who they encountered and people that were captured was really pretty harsh. And so some of the people who were undecided start becoming um, uh, patriots because of what the British did. So the colonists win the war. Actually, the British more or less give up. Um, and I'm going to sort of stop here with a timeline of, of British history. Um, from here to the Civil War, it's a, basically economic history and slavery. Um, the Constitution. Uh, outlawed the importation of slavery in 1808. South Carolina was the only state to not already have done that. South Carolina is tied to slavery. Slavery was the lifeblood of the economy. They were the wealthiest of states, but as the year goes, years go on, the, the land is wearing out, the crop yields are going down, and there's more and more competition from other states. And yet the, the majority of the population in the state are African-Americans, are slaves. And there's a real fear of the abolition of slavery. What would happen if we suddenly, if these slaves suddenly were freed? Um, there is a fear of the growing size and power and economic wealth of the North. There are disputes over the rights of the states. Um, which is more important, the federal government, the state government? Can a state um, say we're not going to obey a federal law? John C. Calhoun, a South Carolinian, is um, the spokesman for nullification and, and against federal power. Um, and so this sort of economic history of, an, of a place that was very wealthy, that seen its wealth disappear, um, and fighting desperately to hold on to it um, really makes up most of the 1800s. Um, and South Carolina by, the, by 1900 has really descended into being one of the poorest states. And what, of course, we're beginning to see now is South Carolina finding ways of developing economic power again. The palmetto tree was added to our flag in 1861. Um, 
Colonel Moultrie had built his fort out of uh, palmetto trees and the British cannonballs bounced off the side of the forts. This is considered by experts, I don't know who they are, probably self-proclaimed, to be one of the best state flags in the United States. And by the way, there is no official design. You can find different permutations of this um, flag. The, the palmetto tree might be different, um, and that's okay. Um, and of course, we know the state is the palmetto state. But for a brief period of time, from 1930 to 1935, it was known as the iodine state. Um, and we um, sold ourselves. We knew that if you didn't have um, iodine in your diet, you might get goiter, you'd have thyroid problems. Um, and there was no iodized salt at that point. And so South Carolina began selling itself as our fruits and vegetables have more iodine in them than any fruits and vegetables in the country. Well, they do have a lot, uh, but um, unfortunately, uh, Morton Salt comes along and uh, puts iodizes it, and so it, it loses its idea, identity as the iodine state. If you go down to St. John's Island, you can see the angel tree, which is thought to be the oldest living thing east of the Mississippi. We think it is more than 1,500 years old. About two thirds of South Carolina is forested and almost three fourths of that forest is a privately owned. Um, if you go to Sumter, you can find a plantation to over 12,000 acres with 12 million ginkgo trees in it. We produce more peaches than Georgia. Georgia may claim to be the peach state, but we produce more peaches. And according to one restaurant in Atlanta, which never wants its name to be used, the peaches from South Carolina are bigger, tastier, and better than Georgia peaches. We are the home of Frogmore stew, um, which is a one pot meal. Um, and of course, you can't be in the Carolinas and not have the great barbecue debate. Um, you know, is it vinegar and pepper? Is it tomato sauce? Is it ketchup? Is it mustard based? Um, South Carolina tends to be mustard based. Um, and one place to get it is Scotty's in Hemingway. One of the things I found really interesting um, is when you look about the places that they say to go to get good barbecue, they're kind of dives. They're the kind of place you look at and you go, whoa, why would I ever walk in there? And many of them are only open like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and there's, you know, you just have a, um, uh, a set menu. And of course you have banana pudding for dessert. I had uh, my one cousin, it was not Hemingway, but it was one place that, um, out towards Florence uh, that they went and they ate, there were four of them and they, they went and she said they just ate and ate and ate because everything was so good. And they were so full that they were all getting heartburn and they stopped at Blenheim and picked up um, the, the uh, ginger ale there um, and passed one bottle of that around and um, said that got rid of all the heartburn that they have, most of them just taking a sip or two. I happen to be one of the few people in the family who could drink, drink all of it, but um, that's because I like ginger beer. So the great barbecue debate. And of course, chicken bog. Um, uniquely South Carolina. Um, we don't know why it's called chicken bog, but if you haven't, and I don't think there's a specific recipe, everybody has their own, and I'm not sure that it isn't different every time you make it. Um, now, a couple of odd things have ever happened in, in South Carolina. Um, if you want tea, for example, uh, you can get tea here. One of the few places in the United States that actually, um, in fact, the only place in the United States that has a, a working tea plantation. Um, we have boiled peanuts. 
Um, and this, we think they started boiling the peanuts in the 1800s. In 2006, it became the official snack, probably used during the Civil War um, by the soldiers for protein. Once the peanuts are boiled, they don't spoil. Uh, Orangeburg claims to be, claims to have the first stand selling boiled peanuts in the 1920s. Now in 1969, in the town of um, Chester, there was a Cremora plant and something went wrong with one of the vents and suddenly Cremora, do you remember Cremora, the coffee, you know, it snowed Cremora in Chester. Uh, the ground is covered with Cremora. We don't often see snow, but in 1973, it was 24 inches of snow near Lake Marion. And in February 2010, Myrtle Beach had snow. It was gone in about three days, but they had a significant amount of snow. Not only did we get snow occasionally, but you can get gold in South Carolina. Um, in the 1850s, William Dorr struck gold in what is now McCormick, South Carolina. Over a period of several years, Dorn extracted millions of dollars worth of gold from his gold mine. In 1869, convinced he had exhausted the mining opportunities, he sold the property to Cyrus McCormick, who was the developer of farm equipment, and McCormick renamed the town uh, McCormick. Um, there are still places in that area of the state where gold nuggets have been found. You can pan for gold in some of those places. And the latest gold rush in South Carolina occurred in the 1980s and 1990s as the price of gold went up. Um, three mining operations became commercially, commercially profitable during that time. Now, there is gold. It's just very expensive to get to. And if the price of gold is not high enough, it's not worth the investment to get it. Um, but yeah, there's gold in them there hills in South Carolina. We've had some interesting people live in South Carolina. Um, we have the shag that was invented here. Uh, and uh, Jimmy and Elaine Heavener are shaggers. Uh, they have shagged for us at Arts in the Church. But we had a dancer here called Peg Leg Bates. Uh, Peg Leg Bates um, lost his right leg when he was nine years old. And uh, he was born in Fountain, uh, South Carolina. He was on the Ed Sullivan Show 21 times. So chances are we all saw him at some point. His signature move was to jump into the air and land on his peg leg. This man danced until he was 89 years old. Um, in, the, in 1951, he established an integrated country club here in South Carolina. He died 22 years ago at the age of 91. He had only not been dancing for two years. Um, kind of an interesting person. If you ever get out in that area, go to Fountain Inn, South Carolina, and you can see his statue. In 1743, the first golf game was played here. We don't have an NFL team, an NHL team, an MLS team, and a Major League Baseball team, but we can claim golf. Um, the early golf game was played without a set number of holes and no greens and no designated teen areas. The players used clubs to move a ball around a field and into a crudely dug hole in the ground. Because the holes were not clearly marked, the golfers sent finders, the forerunner of today's caddies, to stand by the hole and alert others of the approaching shot by yelling four. Uh, after the completion of a hole, a player would tee off at a distance of two club lengths away from that hole. The equipment included a ball made of leather and stuffed with feathers, while the clubs had um, a series of woods and an iron for tight spots. The South Carolina Golf Club was organized in September 
1786. So the South Carolina Golf Club is older than the U.S. Constitution. Um, and um, so, you know, we're playing golf here. Now, there's also something else interesting about South Carolina. It's the only state that's ever had an atomic bomb dropped on them. Yeah. In 1958, the United States government accidentally dropped a nuclear bomb on South Carolina. Um, the bomb, the plane carrying the bomb uh, was flying over the state. The bomb broke free, fell through the plane's floor, nosedived 14,000 feet into South Carolina. The impact damaged several buildings, created a crater which was 70 feet across and 35 miles deep, uh, and in injured six people. It did not detonate. Um, um, but here it is. If you want to see this site, you have to look for it. It's near Florence. It's about six and a half miles east of Florence on um, US um, 301, East Palmetto Street. So there's definitely a sign. Uh, the trigger detonated, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't radioactive. Um, but, but, you know, certainly a claim to fame. Um, you know, just tell that to your friends and relatives who live elsewhere. Kathleen? Yeah. Did they retrieve the bomb? Yes. Um, we have a UFO welcome center. Now, frankly, if I were a UFO and I saw this, I would go, I'm leaving. Um, but just in case the UFOs come, we're going to welcome them. We have an island. It's officially Morgan Island, but it's it's known as Monkey Island. It houses the only colony of free-ranging rhesus monkeys in the United States. This is an island where no people live, just monkeys. There's about uh, 3,500 monkeys um, who live here and run free. Um, you can uh, take your boat and go along the coast and, and uh, take pictures. Um, I'm not sure I really would want to go to that island. Now, Strom Thurmond. Yeah, Lynn? Uh, on the Monkey Island, how do they maintain the population there? Is it the uh, Department of Natural Resources takes care of that or? I think whatever is there, um, you know, the monkeys are living quite happily off of whatever grows there naturally. Okay. That's a good question. <laughs> okay. Strom Thurmond was the first U.S. Senator ever to be elected by write-in votes. Now, uh, Lisa, Lisa Murkowski uh, repeated that in 2010. Uh, but what had happened was the Democratic candidate for Senator died in September. And a replacement was picked, but nobody really liked that replacement. So Thurman, who was the governor, threw his hat in the ring and he won. And he then spent 48 years in the Senate. He started as a Democrat, of course, ended up as a Republican. He served in the Senate until 2003. Um, he became, um, in, in uh, 1996, he became the oldest person to serve in the Senate. Um, he then became the first Senator to reach the age of 100 while still in office. And um, he was the longest serving member in, in Senate history um, until his record was beaten by Robert Byrd of West Virginia in 2006. Um, Strom Thurmond is probably worth an hour in and of himself, particularly as we now come up that the, he had a, um, he was a, a real advocate for um, segregation. And yet he had a, um, um, an affair with an African-American woman and has African-American children. Um, so um, everybody has odd laws. So I just want you to pay attention to hear this, particularly number two and number three, okay? Get your horse out of your bathtub, okay? Can't have a horse in your bathtub. And I wanna see number three on, on 17. 
Um, if you're approaching an intersection in an automatic vehicle, stop 100 feet from the intersection and fire a gun or rifle to warn the horse traffic. Can you just see that on 17? Um, you know, we'd have no movement whatsoever. Um, anyway, I have tried in this time period to um, give you a taste of um, South Carolina. Um, you know, certainly not everything. Um, we could all, you know, can do more. Um, but you have a limited time that you can sit and not have to go to the bathroom. Um, so, and I do too. So anyway, just a taste of South Carolina, a little bit of the history and a little bit of some odd things about it. Okay, questions. Thank you very much. That's, uh, other than knowing about Strom Thurmond, I, I didn't know 90% of those facts. That was, that was amazing. It is, it is kind of, it's a fascinating state and it's fascinating in how it, um, in, in its role. And I think, I don't know what it's like to go to school in South Carolina and how they would, they would teach it. Um, but I certainly know that in my education in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and teaching in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, South Carolina becomes the troublemaker, but you never explain why they're that. And, you know, I hate to be, I hate to think of myself as an economic historian, but if I look at South Carolina in economic terms, I really understand why they did what they did. Um, and of course, the, the theory is always thrown out there that had the Civil War not happened when it did, that slavery might in fact have died out um, because of economic reasons. That it, wasn't, it was becoming less and less economically viable but South Carolina and other places were hanging on. And it's also the power, because the majority of people in South Carolina did not own slaves. And ultimately, the argument is not in terms of slavery, but the argument is in terms of states' rights. And that's an argument that we're still having today. Um, you know, how much power does the federal government have and how much should they have and how much, you know, where is the right of the state? Where is the right of the individual? And I think South Carolina from its very beginning has this emphasis on the individual, the powers in the hands of the individual, and then the local government and, and less likely in the federal government. But um, I think one of the reasons why the Articles of Confederation were a very loose um, organization with a lot of power in the hands of the state. Um, and I think South Carolina ratifying that first is really a symbol of them saying, okay, yes, we need to work together for some things, but everything else is up to us. Whereas the constitution is much, really shifts some power. And we're still arguing where that shift belongs. Um, and um, you know, nothing's new under the sun. <laughs>